Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Community Healthcare Forum, Impacts of the Erosion of Reproductive Autonomy. We are here this evening uh, with a lot of different folks who can provide some great information. But also, I'd like to point out that Wake Dems is partnering with Progressive Democrats of Wake County and Wake Young Dems for tonight's show. Again, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm going to give some information here at the beginning. My name is Kevin Creech, and I'm chair of Wake County Democratic Party. Next slide, please. Right, what we're covering this evening, uh, it has to do with more than just conception to birth, which by the way, is a very important time period. So we're not minimizing that. Uh, tonight's discussion will be a panel forum style panel. It will be segmented into these broad topics, health impacts, particularly to women and children, social mobility also particularly as it affects women and children, broader societal impacts as it affects everybody, and what do we do now? So I want to say a little uh, piece about the term women. Not all birthing people identify as women, but historically it's women's bodies that have been politicized and our lives controlled by reproduction and when and how and with whom we could reproduce. So for the purposes of tonight's forum, we will be referencing the term women, but please note that not all folks who can give birth identify as a woman. Next slide, please. All right, during the RSVP period, we collected several queries and topics. We collated that information. It has been provided to all of tonight's speakers, but these were also, could also broadly be characterized into three sort of like arenas. One, what are the actual steps that we can take now or as soon as possible to provide good information, support, and health care to citizens? A lot of us are very concerned about that. Two, how do we push back on this now, meaning before 2024? And third, what can we do to politically organize and mobilize to take back North Carolina and or elect more leaders who respect bodily autonomy in 2024. So these were the top topics that came out of those queries, but I'm sure that tonight's panel will give us more information than we can probably process, which is why we are recording this so we can share this with other stakeholders as needed. I would like to now turn this over to, I believe we have Mr. Mason Shamley is our first introducer, am I correct? Yes. All right, uh, Mason, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kevin. My name is Mason Shamley. I'm president of the Young Democrats of Wake County. Uh, and I am happy to introduce Dr. Kim Hardy. She is the North Carolina Democratic Party's second vice chair. And then I will pass it on to our uh, next introduction. Hi, um, I'm Ambrosia Sharkey, I'm the Wake Regional Vice Chair for uh, the Wake County Democratic Party, but also the Treasurer for the Progressive Democrats of Wake County. And I'll be introducing Elizabeth Goodwin, and she is the President of the Democratic Women of North Carolina. Nice. on. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, next, we have uh, Jillian Riley with us, the NC Director of Public Affairs, Planned Parenthood, South Atlantic. Hi, everyone. I'm Christy Bird, our fourth vice chair for Wake County Democratic Party, and I'm happy to introduce Dr. Yao Lu, who's a member of the North Carolina House of Representatives, representing District 21, and also a member of the Terry Town Council. Hi, everybody. I'm Nicole. I'm the Apex Regional Vice Chair for the County Party, and I'm happy to introduce Maria Cervania, who is a representative for North Carolina House District 41.
Hi folks, <clears throat> I'm Nick Long. I am the first vice chair of the Wake County Democratic Party. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you my representative, Sarah Crawford, who currently represents NC House 66 after having spent two years as a senator. All right, thank you so much. And we're hoping that uh, Senator Childry can join us in a bit. All right, so we're going to have some really good discussions here. Speakers, presenters, we are so grateful for you. What you can expect is to be spotlit in a group. Uh, we know what the first topic is that we're going to tackle and you've been able to see some of the queries and what we're really looking for is for y'all to hold forth and tell us what you think, tell us what you know, give us some guidance and we're really excited about that. Uh, we need it badly. I do wanna point out that Maria Savania is my representative. Uh, I needed to get that in just in case. And I'm really excited that she's here. But let's start with a very short story for all of you. And this is a true story. It's about my grandmother. My grandmother was born in 1926 in rural Eastern North Carolina. She was born into poverty. Um, by the time she was 18 months old, she had lost one parent. And by the time she was five, she was an orphan. Um, she was passed around from house to house, as was the norm. Back then, you go to your aunts and you go to your older siblings and so on and so forth. She was very brilliant, um, worked really hard. She and her siblings picked cotton. They picked uh, peanuts. They would go up to Virginia and do that. This is how they lived. Um, <clears throat> she was able to complete high school, which we were really grateful for. Again, she was brilliant. But she was a poor young lady living in rural North Carolina. Um, and when her the love of her life left to go off to war, he left her with a present. Um, she was pregnant. She had graduated from high school. Her family was very poor and they said, we love you, but we cannot afford another mouth. So you need to make a choice. You can go up to the Salvation Army in Durham and have that baby. And if you wanna give that baby away, you can come home. Or if you keep that baby, you can't come home because we can't afford it. So she chose to keep my uncle and she moved to, uh, to the coast and ended up marrying my grandfather. And that decision that she made ensured that she lived in poverty or and the highest she ever got socioeconomically was working poor her entire life. And um, her children were not well. They lost all their teeth before they were teenagers. It was that sort of situation and that was the norm. That's what happened when you were poor and you were pregnant and you had no resources. So she was a hell of a progressive. Um, she helped raise me. Um, she would be on fire right now if she knew what was happening. So I'm kind of glad she's not here to see all this, but um, I'm sharing the story with y'all to let everyone know this affects everybody. And so we are so grateful to have some guidance from those of you who are here tonight to guide us. And I would like to go ahead and open this conversation to these wonderful people here this evening. Um, Mr. Knott, can you read what our first broad discussion point is for this evening? Sure. Uh, our first broad discussion point is what are actual steps that we can take now or as soon as possible to provide good information, support, and health care to citizens? That's providing good information, support, and health care to citizens now or as soon as possible. Anyone who wants to kick it off may. The only one unmuted, so I'll go ahead and start. <laughs> it seems like that was a, a thing. So, um, well, I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you so much, not just for hosting this, but having all of us here to join. This is such an important uh, topic and um, I wish it was not always a topic, but it still is in, in, in ways that are disgusting. Um, but thank you for recognizing the need to have this and pulling us together and including me in this esteemed group of, of speakers. Um, some of the things that I think we can start doing right now is we have to get the word out. Um, I think, it, and it needs to be fact-based. So I like to say all the time that 
like people who aren't politicos, right, who aren't like enmeshed in this context the same way we are, either as electeds or people who are in um, auxiliary organizations or something like that, people who aren't this plugged in really don't necessarily know what's happening with all of the nuance of these things every day because they're busy trying to live their lives. And so it's hard to keep up with all of the, especially when you have a, a legislature that is just pushing things through like day after day after day because they've wielded, they're wielding some power. Um, and so I think the most important thing that we can do is put important and in, inaccurate information out to the general public. So um, I have been saying in, in all speaking engagements here recently, let's take our outrage outside. And instead of marching around the General Assembly building, which we should do because we want to level our discontent, we want them to know that we see them and that we're listening. But I really look forward to us not showing up one day and they're like blown away because where are they and where we are is in our communities, knocking on doors and dropping off lit that says that really speaks to three things. What exactly is the issue? How does it affect you right now today? And what is something that you can do today to fix it? And so, and written in plain English, not political speak, and dropping it on the doors, particularly of voters who have lower turnout scores, because those also tend to be demographically the people most impacted by this type of horrific legislation. And i um, happy to keep chatting, but I'll yield back the balance to the rest of the ladies on the panel. I want to hear what Jillian has to say. Well, good evening, y'all. Um, Jillian Riley with Planned Parenthood. Um, first of all, I'm excited to be here and it's good to see everyone on the panel again. Um, I wanna, um, if this is a tough question to answer um, only because I keep thinking about um, a statement Senator Jay Chaudhry said during the debate which was, I'm surprised you didn't give funding to all the women to be able to hire lawyers to navigate this law. And truthfully, that's the reality is that patients are now having, are now feeling like they are, you know, have to go to become, become legal experts in order to access abortion care. Um, so that's the first thing I'll say is that um, I did put together just two slides, which we can go over at some point tonight just to like outline the the law. Um, but that's that's one thing I'll say is that I think what's so important now is that um, we listen to our neighbors and our family um, and we let them know that there are organizations like Planned Parenthood, the Carolina Abortion Fund, uh, Pro-Choice North Carolina that can connect you with care. You do not need to know all the answers. You do not need to be able to navigate this law. That is our job. We, we must do that. Um, and we are expanding our patient navigation system. Um, you know, a lot of our patients access care, um, you know, on by creating appointments online. Um, but we're completely revamping our, our way of doing things. And we'll now be just calling patients directly to answer questions because so many people are confused. Um, so I think just as, as citizens and as residents, it's definitely important that we just let folks know it's okay. <laughs> there are people here to help. We can do this together. Um, and just really like level setting with folks um, in, you know, a human connection kind of way. Um, because it is really just like, it's, it's a confusing time. Um, and, you know, July 1st, it, it'll be here before we know it, um, is the truth, so. So um, I don't really have a whole lot to add um, uh, to what Dr. Hardy and Jillian um, just shared. Um, you know, just to echo um, uh, both of the points that, that were made is that we really do have to communicate um, what, what this bill is about and make sure that people understand that if we don't take action ahead of 2024 and really get organized, um, we run the risk of having additional abortion bans um, given to us. I mean, that's already been said. Um, uh, and if, you know, we know that a lot of people 
um, are not like us. Um, you know, we we are we are the ones who are paying attention, and we need to make sure that people who um, maybe aren't in it as deeply or um, are busy working multiple jobs and trying to put food on the table and trying to take care of their families really understand um, what's in this bill. I've heard a lot of people um, say, well, this bill could have been so much worse. Okay, sure, I'm sure that's true. Um, but, and, you know, and, and their reasoning is, well, it's 12 weeks, it's not six weeks or a total ban. Um, and there are all these exceptions to it. But here's what I'll say about that. And you all know this, but this is what we have to communicate. Um, make sure that people understand really how egregious it is. A lot of people do not know they are pregnant before 12 weeks um, or don't know what some of the challenges with their pregnancy might be um, until after 12 weeks. Um, the second thing about you know, all of these exceptions, um, the law, the way that it's written is really vague on, what, on these exceptions and how these exceptions are defined. Um, and I, it is, I get really emotional about this because it just, it makes me so angry that we as women have to stand up and bear our souls to people who will never understand what it's like to be pregnant or to lose a pregnancy, however you might lose it, um, and, and to justify why this is so bad. But, you know, for, for the exceptions of a woman's life is in danger, for example, there's no... Um, there's no parameter on how close to dying a woman has to be in order to perform an abortion. And so when we think, you know, when you, we hear people say, well, it's not as bad as it could be. Okay. On, on a very like policy level, that is true, but we need to make sure that we're armed with the information to be able to counter that so that people understand how truly bad um, this law is. Yes, yeah. Um, there isn't much more to say. Like, I am going to go back to a mix of what Jillian and Representative Crawford had said. Um, we need to be trusting our healthcare professionals and pro our providers on this. And and going back to people who are trying to seek information from us. We make crappy doctors, right? Still, like we keep saying that, and we really need to direct people to strengthen even their relationship with their OBGYN to make these decisions. And um, you know, we're trying to take the responsibility to to help the medical society and the OBGYN society to get in good information to you and other healthcare providers. You know, Planned Parenthood, all the organizations that 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 have been mentioned by um, Jillian, these are the ones that are working in partnership to, to even safeguard what our doctors are, are confused about when it comes to what's legal or not. And, and going back to what Representative Crawford said, we don't know. I mean, like we created this law and there's not any parameter, there's not any definition because this law was made by politicians. So, when it comes to people who are coming to us, who are our friends, our family, who are trying to seek care, abortion care, we, we really do need to strengthen and encourage them to strengthen their relationship with their provider and, and make decisions that, and remind the fundamental part of this, this is a person's decision with their provider and their family. And, and embrace them, nurture them in, in that space because it's a horrible, like horrible time sometimes to, to vacillate between what to do. So we need to try to uplift people in that space and time, right? So. Thank you so much for those wonderful answers. Um, it's good to hear them. I think also the fact that all of you are struggling a little bit with particulars because we're in this nebulous space. It's actually kind of comforting because I think a lot of us out in 
you know, the, the regular walks of life are in this nebulous space. And it it's good to hear our leaders and our policymakers really thinking through this and thinking out loud. So I'm going to go to the next, we're going to move to the next topic. And the next like broad topic has to do with the effects of you know, losing your reproductive autonomy. How does that affect people's social mobility, like economics and everything else, and particularly as it per, uh, pertains to women and children. So open up and get started and I'll be quiet now. So I think this is one of the things that frustrates me the most about this bill. I mean, everything in it frustrates me, right? But um, it's not just about abortion, right? It's not just about what they purport it to be about. It very much feels to me at least, and I can't figure out a way that it's not an attempt to control women, right? And to control their ability to better themselves and their families. Um, and the only motive that I can figure out is that, you know, the people who have traditionally had power want to keep that power. Um, they don't want women to be social, uh, socially mobile. Um, you know, 13.6% of women live in poverty and 18.2% of children live in poverty in North Carolina. And um, this bill doesn't really do anything for those people, right? Um, there's maybe some child care subsidy stuff in it that uh, that is one thing I would say if we're going to message this and how awful it is, if people actually do need help, there is there are a couple things in there that could help. Um, but really, just getting back to the, the question, I would say that, um, I mean, you touched on it, Kevin, with that story about your grandmother, like that's that's what people's lives are going to look like now. It's what they've looked like for a long time, honestly, um, in North Carolina, where we don't have enough access. Um, but uh, those are the people that need the help the most. Um, if you are wealthy, you will figure out a way to do what you need to do, right? Um, and so this is setting back an entire generation of women, of children, um, of Let's just be honest, it's, it's mostly people of color that this is going to impact. It's people in lower social mobility, you know, socioeconomic ranges. And it means that they're not going to have the money that they maybe wanted to to move forward and go to college or get career training or um, do whatever they needed to do to make their lives better. Um, and it has taken that autonomy away from them. So um, I keep seeing these comments about uh protesting, uh, getting getting the economics involved, right? And I actually think that's a pretty good idea. Um, we saw that that's how we forced change with gay marriage, right? With the bathroom bill, with all of those things is let's get companies to put their, their money where their mouths are, right? And support the people who support them. Um, and so I think that's another side of, of the socioeconomic impact that this could have. Um, but just in general, I will just put out there that I think that um, the motives behind this are much more economic than one might think, in my opinion. Representative Lowe, did you have something? I'm driving. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that um, with SB 20, um, this bill was voted and passed by a whole bunch of male legislators who basically made, made decisions for so many girls and women, young women, when they could have their families. When the women, young women, felt that it's not time for them to start a family to have a child, to raise a child, and they would be forced to do so. And this is not women's decision, it's a forced decision. And when the bill was voted on that night, and uh, as well as the night that the veto or right happened, and many of us, especially female legislators, we were in tears. It was very emotional. And 
it was it's emotional for so many of us, lawmakers and our citizens. We felt like powerless that we couldn't help and we couldn't do anything. It's just we were in that position. And we don't want to be in that position anymore. And we need to do everything we can to get out of the super minority and do everything we can to turn voters out. Uh, elections have consequences. This is what we had to deal with, and we can change that with the next election. Um, I I just sorry. Oh, sorry, Representative Servania. I saw you like nicely, politely raising your hand, and I'm just like, I have something to say. I'm all fired up now, y'all. Um, so I just um, was reminded of this quote. This was from a while ago, I think last August, when um, Serena Williams was deciding uh, to retire. And I read it, it came across my, my social media feed today for whatever reason, probably because the universe knew that I needed to read it. And, and I just want to read this. She says about choosing her family or her career, Believe me, I never wanted to choose between tennis and a family. I don't think it's fair. If I were a guy, I wouldn't be writing this because I'd be out there playing and winning while my wife was doing the physical labor of expanding our family. Maybe I'd be more of a Tom Brady if I had that opportunity. And I just think that that so well encapsulates the social mobility impacts of this bill when you don't give women the right to choose when they start their family or choose what for whatever reason they're making that choice. Representative Servani, are you having trouble unmuting? There she is. Yeah, I was going to wait because uh, no, you go me. first because you got emotional and I I lowered my hand initially because I'm like I need her voice I need her voice now I'll wait. Uh, so that was really powerful. Thank well first thank you, Dr. Hardy, and that was really powerful, Representative Crawford, because it's so true. I mean, and and the level of empathy I'm like going to just be we're amongst family here is so low. <laughs> I mean, like the understanding and, and, and I'm most concerned about the women, the women in the house and the women in the Senate who brought forward this conference motion. It's like, like one of them just talked about everything in this bill that wasn't the abortion part of this bill. And it's like, what, <laughs> what, who is, is, is tainting your viewpoint on this to not have an understanding that you have a responsibility for not only everyone in North Carolina, but most especially in, for women, you're all women. And, and I can't believe not one of them has had a situation where they have, didn't have a friend or had to deal with a miscarriage in their family, like something. Because every room that I've been in Three out of the four women in there has had some need of decision that is surrounded in abortion or reproductive health care. Uh, and, and so that, that's one thing. But I want to go back to the economics of this because, um, you know, we see it in, in the notes. And I try to talk about the economics because that's the language that the Republicans actually understand for the most part. Um, our small businesses actually did come out. So David Meeker, Ashley Christensen, and for the most part, 80% of our workforce is actually employed by small businesses. So there's an attempt on doing that. And, and I really do commend them along with this great grouping of people and we could send their press conference along. But it is true, you know, during HB2, a lot of our big companies stepped out and and they're quiet right now. <laughs> and women are more than 50% of our population in North Carolina. So I think that we have a responsibility and we need to, and I'm gonna personally contact Apple, Amgen, Fujifilm, because 
and we we as women need to contact every like as somebody said here money talks so you can do it one way by you know if you're not going to support women and their reproductive decision making then we're gonna do something about that by maybe not supporting you financially wise and 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 really supporting businesses who are our allies who are trying to fight with us so yeah communication talking to these businesses in terms of having them support us and also supporting businesses who uh economic wise in terms of that Kevin, do I have time to say just a quick thing? Because I know we're on a time budget. Yes. I can wait if you want. No, okay. no, you do. You do. And I'll just let everyone know after this topic, we're going to roll into broader societal impacts. And then after that topic, we are going to roll into what do we do now? So you've got it. <laughs> party. Thank you. Because now I've got to put on my social work professor hat. And as someone who has worked in uh, low income schools as a school social worker for my practice career, um, before I became a nerdy professor, this is something I had to deal with a lot was the generational impact of limited social mobility when decisions like this uh, are made. And so, you know, a lot of times I had those decisions getting made from within the house where maybe the parent does not approve of the child getting an abortion. Usually there's some sort of religious reason, that sort of thing. Um, but my ethical responsibility as a social worker is to provide options counseling and all of the options have to be provided and abortion is one of them. And so I always talked about it no matter what. And in most of the places where I've worked, you did not need uh, an, uh, an adult's consent to get an abortion. And so many times I just helped my clients take care of that themselves. And so, um, and always, always, thankfully, in their communities was a Planned Parenthood who could help them with accessing that health care. And so, but the the economic piece of this is, is generational. And you know that very well from the story that you just told us about your grandmother. Um, and, and I don't think this is a consideration. I honestly don't think that this is a consideration because so many Republicans in the legislature care about abortion. I really don't. I think it's a dog whistle. And I think it's an ideological culture war piece that they know drums up their base. Because, so shameless plug, I'm part of the New Hunt Institute Social Policy Fellows Group, right? And we were talking a few weeks ago in Greensboro, and there was a sitting senator there, Senator Bergen, and we were talking about early childhood education and why that is in such peril right now and how, you know, we have to do things to sort of strengthen that because that limits people's ability to work and to go back to school and things like this. Um, and he said, as in, in the most genteel way possible, this horrific set of circumstances, well, I don't think that the government should be raising our children. And, you know, my wife and I had a conversation that I wanted her to stay home and she wanted to stay home. Like he made sure that we were clear that, that she wanted to stay home. And, and it just was interesting to me how he's part of this bicameral and bipartisan early childhood education caucus and yet doesn't genuinely believe in funding early childhood education. So what this is about is not, we want children to be born and be educated well and fed and given good schools with really well-trained and well-paid teachers with the highest technology possible in the class. That's not what this is about. At its core, this is a power grab. And this is a thing that they do that keeps their base on their toes because they have told their base that this matters even though it does not matter. Some of the people in their base are the same people who are struggling to put food on the table for mouth after mouth after mouth. And I am absolutely sure, I am certain that there are women in these homes that wish they could have access to an abortion, but the ideologies of their spouses keeps them from being able to do that. As you can see, this is an issue that is firing me up. And so what we have to do is start empowering Empowering women. I tell people all the time that we can't just try to get Democratic voters to the polls. We have to pull those independent or unaffiliated voters on issues because this is an issue for women at every economic level. We have a, a, a thing in academia as women that we talk about how men get to ascend to like it's senior levels of administration. They get to publish all these articles and do all of the things that are the currency of academia because they have a wife at home. 
and the wife is the one that is taking care of the children. The wife is the one that is doing the work of it, like the Serena Williams quote suggested. And so it's understandable that they would be working all hours of the night so that they can get these articles out and write this grant because there's, and no one admonishes them for not being home with those children because that's what the wife wants to do. That's what Senator Bergen said his wife did. That's what he told us his daughters are doing. And that's that old fashioned mentality that says you should stay home and barefoot and pregnant, but also make sure dinner is cooked by the time I get here and look pretty girly as you do it. That's what this is. And so these people are not pro-life, they are pro-birth and they don't care anything about you after that. And so it's an economic situation for low income women, but it's also an economic situation for women in jobs and careers where they are maybe on the fast track, but they are m missing out on opportunities for advancement because they have decided that they have the audacity to go get pregnant. And then if they don't want to have access, if they don't have access to abortion care, then they are saddled with this responsibility. And I don't say that I'm a single mom. I'm not saying that in a negative way. They are stuck. We have to give people choices. And that is all we have ever said as Democrats. I'm being very partisan here. That's all we've ever said is that you have the choice. So I wrote in my notes because I didn't want to be impolite in the Hunt Institute because I knew if I said something to him out loud, I would be. And I just wrote, wow, so much privilege, the privilege for her to be able to stay at home. There are women who want to be able to do that and cannot because of economics. And so this social mobility piece, it's impacted at every single level. Once those babies emerge, no one cares about them on the right. They don't. And so I know we're going to move into like, what does this mean for society writ large? And then what do we do about it? And so I will save the rest of my vitriol for that. But suffice it to say that this issue of social mobility is terrible at every socioeconomic level for women at, at, at every stage of their career and every stage of their life. And all we are saying when we are saying pro-choice is that give anyone who wants the choice to have a, a child the choice to do that. I will die on the hill for you to do that. But also everyone who doesn't want to do that uh, should get the choice to, to, be, to make that choice as well. And I will end it this piece with this. Be very clear that we did not outlaw abortion. We didn't even limit it to 12 weeks. What we did was we made it illegal and unsafe. And they know that and they don't care. So I'm riled up now too, Sarah Crawford. Listen, I'm, I'm fired up, but I'm gonna mute myself back and, and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Dr. Party. Uh, before we get to the broader societal impacts, and I think that you, know, you all did a good intro for that, and we can talk about that in a moment. Really quickly, so that our folks who are viewing this, when does SB 20, when do these laws actually take effect? Because that's a mystery to some people. So can somebody unmute and tell us uh, when this becomes the law of the land? Might be time for my little presentation. <laughs> it may be time for your little presentation. Do you have pull up my two slides real quick? Um, posting ability. Can you grab your slides? Yes, I got it right here. Okay. Right. So let me. That looks good. Um, so I just want to quickly go over current law. So right now, right, SB 20 doesn't go into, into effect until July 1st. Um, these are just some of the restrictions that we have already had in North Carolina for many years. Um, first thing, 91% of counties in North Carolina do not have an abortion provider, right? The majority of rural counties in the state do not have one. There are 14 clinics, um, nine of which are um, Planned Parenthood and or six of which are Planned Parenthood. Um, and you can see that uh, they're all pretty much in, in uh, urban areas. Um, and the different, they, they provide abortions at different gestational weeks um, for various reasons. So there is not also equitable care at every single one of these locations. Um, we have had so many bans and restrictions that I'm not even gonna go over them because we're now just adding on top of uh, what current restrictions we have. Um, so I'll give folks a minute, but this is always a good slide to just take a screenshot or take a photo. Um, I know it'll be on YouTube online, but this is a good one to just 
come back to later, taking a beat, and then SB20. So additional regulations starting July 1st. First and foremost, all patients are required to receive the bias counseling script and affirm each individual point in person before the 72 hour clock can start. So what we have been doing is reading them the bias counseling script over the phone, um, and that starts the 72 hour mandatory delay. That starts the clock that now has to be done in person, which means every single patient has to come in twice. Medication abortion will only be allowed up to 10 weeks. Currently, we provide abortion care for medication abortion up to 11 weeks per FDA regulations. That reduces it to 10. Medication abortion patients will also be required to schedule an additional third appointment after seven to 14 days after their second appointment, completely medically unnecessary. Um, I should add that many states, including Virginia right above us, provide medication abortion via telehealth. That's a previous ban and restriction that we've had for many years. Um, abortion is banned. This is where it gets tricky, and this is where I think about that the need to feel like you're a lawyer. Um, so abortion is banned after 12 weeks with limited exceptions. So from 12 to 20 weeks, exceptions for rape and incest. From 20 to 24 weeks, these life-limiting fetal anomalies. And during all weeks of pregnancy, the exception for life and medical emergency. I think Representative Crawford did a really great job just saying that there are so many gaps in what these definitions mean. It's completely um, left open-ended, which means that a lot of our providers and doctors and medical staff will feel like they need to consult with an attorney in order to provide care post 12 weeks. Um, all abortions after 12 weeks must be in a hospital. It cannot be in a Planned Parenthood. Um, hospitals and physicians are allowed to refuse to provide abortion care and many hospitals across the state do not provide abortion care as a policy. Um, there are 20 counties in this state that do not have hospital at all. Um, that doesn't overlay how many county, how many uh, hospitals have already denied, um, have already come out to say they're not going to provide abortion care, but it's a lot. <laughs> um, and then lastly, I would just say there are numerous additional medically unnecessary and overly burdensome reporting that, that, form. that providers have to do. Um, in order to um, stay compliant. And we have to send it to DHHS and DSS. Um, and I, I mentioned that because what it does is it takes away our staff time from working with patients and it requires us to have so, many, so much more administrative time. Um, and you might be asking, well, what are those reports doing? A lot of those reports will be sitting in a file cabinet doing absolutely nothing. Um, some of those reports uh, will be presented um, to various committees that list a number of committees, um, doesn't say when, doesn't say if it's annually. Um, but right now, a lot of the reports that we send to DHHS do sit in a filing cabinet and do nothing. Um, so we do expect that to be the same. So I'll end there, but um, this is just, I mean, it's it's a 45 page bill, right? So this is just the nuts and bolts um, of the reality. Um, and I will, before this is done, put in some links for some resources. So if you get someone that asks about how to, you know, get an abortion, um, or if you want to just post it on your social media, like here's a link, um, I'll also put those in the chat because we will answer all the calls um, and every question that anyone has. Thank you so much. Um, seeing it all, like, and just summarized in those two slides, I intellectually knew all of this, but just seeing it together is like, oh my gosh, which brings us to our next bit. We can put these two together, which are the broader, broader societal impacts and what we can do now. And uh, one of our precinct officers put in the chat talking about this is also a class issue. So he was referencing the fact that for younger people, being able to do things like eat, go to home, I mean, it, everything's expensive. If you, if you wanted 
to stay home and raise your child. It's very, very hard to do right now. And I think that's a really good point. So we've got a lot of broader societal impacts that this can have. And we also want to do what know what we can do now. So what have you all got to say about these broader societal impacts? I'm sure that Dr. Liu and Dr. Hardy know quite a bit about it um, in their social work expertise. But uh, share with us if this continues to go apace and we continue losing our reproductive autonomy, what's going to happen? So um, sociological research shows that your early life determines your long-term long uh, life outcomes, right? Um, for women who are not prepared, financially able to have children, and when they are forced to um, carry the pregnancies and have children start their family, they are likely to go into more likely to go into poverty, as we discussed earlier. And and their children would be likely not to have good health outcomes from early on that would lead into more devastating devastating consequences in, later in life. So this not just this will impact women, this will impact their children and impact their families. Um, it's a life event that's not easy to overcome for women. And, um, and we are now giving women the choices and don't, so it's, so it's basically saying that, um, these politicians don't trust women to make their own decisions. And they cannot make wise decisions for themselves and they cannot make wise decisions for their families. And that's not acceptable. So, was Sarah, were you about to say something? No, I defer. No, are you sure? You know how you're riled up. <laughs> I'm saying, I mean, you go, you'll get me riled up and then I'll Okay, say good. Okay, perfect. <laughs> we'll, we'll pass the baton. Um, you're right. Uh, 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 Dr. Louie, this is a this is a, a gender issue and a class issue. It's an economic issue, um, and it's a mental health issue. So you know, it's it's very important that we recognize that there is a a stress to the strain of economic burden. Um, when you have to, I, I show my students in the community organizing class, this documentary online called The Line. If you all haven't seen it, I highly recommend it because it follows four people whose lives uh, end up below the poverty line for reasons that have nothing to do with this stereotypical tropes that we hear about. You don't want to work hard and bootstraps and all that. Um, complete, completely different thing. And there was a woman in there and she says, her name is Sheila. And she says, there is something so like dehumanizing about having to beg for everything that you get. And that's kind of what happens with people who are in these economically challenged communities and they already have, you know, children and maybe they didn't even have access to contraceptive care, which I actually believe is the next thing on the Republican chopping block, but we'll get back to that. Um, but, you know, if, if, if you're already so financially strained that you can't get sick or get a cut, you know, without fear. I was, I, in full disclosure, I was recently in the hospital for four days. I was sick with a lung infection of some sort, asthma. And it was, it wound up costing after insurance still $4,000 as the leftover bill. But I was able to focus on rest and recovery and healing because I knew that my insurance would take care of it. And I had the financial means to take care of whatever was left over. That's not an option for everyone. And so what happens is you get these families that they're in low-income areas with jobs that don't pay that much, or even, again, if we're going back to class issues, women in the professional workforce still get paid less than their male counterparts. Like, childcare costs a ton of money to the point where some women are like, I might as well stay home because my whole paycheck goes to childcare. Like, it's, it's a mental health issue. This is a strain on people's psyche, and it causes all manner of stress. And stress leads to, because we believe very much in a mind-body connection in social work. And so it, this, this mental anguish can result in physical health issues as well. And we're also talking about people who don't have usually access to uh, health care 
from their jobs. And so, you know, it just adds it's so many layers to the onion of this stink that is this consistent, act, you know, conversation around abortion. Um, and so it is economic and it is class based, it's gender based, there's a racial component of this. And there is a mental health piece that looms over this whole thing as well, that nobody really wants to talk about. We know that there are people who get who are in postpartum depression um, and adding one more mouth to that could be very, very difficult and just add to that stress or strain. Or we have people who are just at their wits end and then they start doing things that call my other colleagues into the space. Um, because you know, one of the things we knew when we went on lockdown, which was the right thing to do during the pandemic was all of my social work peers were very worried that the incidence of domestic violence and child abuse would go up and they did. And so, you know, but when you have more children than you planned, God forbid they have some sort of health or mental health challenge. It's just, there's so many layers to this. And it really, this bill has nothing to do with anything societal. Public policy is for solving public issues. This is a private issue. This was settled law for as long as I've been alive. And we need to do everything we can to fix that and put it back right the way that it is. And my idea of like, what do we do now? I put it in the chat, elect more pro-choice women, period, writ large, like legit ones, not the Trisha Cothams. And with that, I yield back. Um, I, know, I know we desperately want to get to what do we do next? Um, what is the call to action? I will just say there's a great, there was a great study that um, Center for American Progress did um, just about the various impacts of restrictive abortion laws. And um, uh, in that report, they referenced an, uh, uh, research from the Institute for Women's Policy and found that restrictive abortion bans um, in one year cost state and local economies 105 billion with a B, billion dollars um, every year um, because of reduced labor force participation and reduced earning levels because of what happens to women when they are forced to cut back hours or leave the workforce entirely. And so back to some of the points that um, uh, my colleagues and fellow pan panelists said um, earlier about um, how do we get businesses involved? That's, um, that's uh, businesses that we're trying to recruit here, um, right? We need to make this the economic argument. And I would say that that is part of what we need to do next as part of this, um, make this the next HB2, right? Pat McCrory lost Governor Cooper because of HB2. Also, Governor Cooper is amazing. But HB2 had a lot to do with it because, because the state lost money. Um, and so, and sorry about the dogs in the background. And so, so I think we really need to dig in on what that 105 billion is for North Carolina and start to make the economic argument about what are we gonna lose because we've done this. Um, I would argue also, if we think about it in the spectrum of how does this give another inch to, um, you know, the erosion of rights in general, women's rights specifically. Um, you know, the the decision um, overturning Roe left open a lot of doors for people to walk through when it comes to privacy rights and things like that. that this bill doesn't do anything to help that, um, you know, um, making it everybody's business apparently, except just yours, um, whether or not you're gonna have an abortion. Um, and we've started seeing more things trying to like, I heard about um, no fault divorce being put at issue in some states uh, because um, men don't like it. The women can just leave when they want to. Um, and that's just ridiculous to me. That's bizarre. Um, but they see divorces, you know, eroding the American family or, or whatever nonsense they want to spew. Um, so that's that's a bigger societal impact also I just wanted to kind of draw attention to. Um, I couldn't agree more about what to do next with Dr. Hardy, like elect more women. Um, and we have to start now. Um, if we've already started, many of us have, but 
we have to start now with looking at some of these um, competitive districts and seeing who can we, uh, you know, who can we pull in to run in those places. Um, and God, I hope they're women, right? Like that's that's what we need is more really strong, intelligent women like the ones that we have here tonight um, with us to serve along with um, along with um, my co-panelists here. Um, I would also say that I really loved Dr. Hardy's idea of um, let's let's put out some literature about this. It's a great way to like year round issue organize guys, right? Like many of you are probably precinct chairs. Maybe that's a project that you do in your precinct that you go and you talk to people, talk to your neighbors about this um, because we've got to keep people engaged. We've got to keep them going so that um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes time um, to to get to the polls. Uh, I'd also say that um, targeted voter registration, um, helping people figure out the new voter ID laws, these are all things that we can do right now to help uh, build our, our power in the future. Um, there's no secret sauce here, unfortunately, I feel like, right? Like, it is just what we always have had to do and what we will continue to have to do to win, which is work. Um, we have to get out there. We have to do the direct voter contact. We have to be ready when opportunities arise. And um, we have to make sure that we get our people to the polls. And that means making phone calls and knocking doors and registering voters and doing those little text things, um, you know, every, you know, pressing a little button, lots. Um, so, you know, that, that would be my message. Like, we're always like, what are we going to do? What are we going to, we know what to do. We just have to do it. Um, so I would encourage everybody to get out there and sign up for a shift to do something. Thank you. It is, I just want to flag at 7.59. I think, um, Representative Cervania has one other thing that she would like to share with us. So Representative Cervania. Very quickly. We have to give them a reason why to vote for us. We have to tell them what we're doing and fighting for for them because we're the ones who are fighting for them, not right. these other people, right? And so we like, and 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 we can ask them to vote and register, like, but we we need them to understand why, and that we are all here. The reason why to get them out there and and to be a accessible, be a resource, just just be relational organization, right? Relational campaigning. That's that's the key to this. And keep it constant because 2024 is a long time from now. But it's also not, right? Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> True. I just want to add that abortion is not a an issue that um, only Democrats care about. Like we know that everyone needs access to abortion care. Republicans get abortions. Catholics get abortions. Every single race gets abortions. Every So I just, I, I say that because I know that everyone on this call, we're nonpartisan, but are Democrats. And I think it's just really important that as we talk to our neighbors and friends and family who we might not normally engage in conversations with about politics, that um, everyone needs access to abortion care. And the polling shows that overwhelmingly Democrats, Republicans, and independents all support access to abortion care. Awesome. Amazing. Oh my goodness. All right. Well, we have come to the end of our session. We've gone over by a minute, but I don't care. I'm so delighted with the information that you all have shared, the conversation that's happening in the chat. Of course, this information will be shared on our YouTube channel. I would like to say um, our focus here at Wake Dems is what we call go to get out the organization. And this right here for a lot of people is the impetus to, as Bill Yoder said, put the hand ringing, do the foot walking. We've got so many things that we do need to talk about. And I do want to just reiterate what we're dealing with with regard to the erosion of reproductive autonomy it's it's of the erosion of rights in general so whether it's with you know lgbtq rights particularly transgender rights um 
access to health care for our trans kids, what we can read. It's all a big, it's all a big thing. Uh, it's all connected. And we can talk about these things relationally, as um, Representative Shivania said, with our friends, with our neighbors. And we have to do that. And we have to move as a unit. And we have to move, we have to be out there a lot, whether we're tabling or lit dropping or knocking on doors, whatever it is. So thank you all for being here this evening. Thank you so very much to all of the folks who uh, tuned in this evening to learn about this and who shared their ideas. Again, we will put this up on our YouTube channel uh, as soon as we get everything rendered. And uh, on that note, I'd like to bid everyone a good evening. Please join us, Wake Dems, Young Dems, Progressive Dems. Check out the information uh, at Planned Parenthood. Please tell your representatives who are doing this hard work, particularly our, our women, um, give them some love and some support. I can't imagine what they are going through as they are navigating this. All right. Good night, everybody.